So, is there, is there any any microphones open? Yeah, I hear some uh, echoes. So, if people could. Yeah, I think we have to mute. Uh, it's it's us probably. Um, so I will mute myself before um, once once you start. So okay, we were having now like Mike Levin's talk, um, and I think where is your screen share? Are you sharing the screen? Correct. I'm already sharing the screen. Yeah. Ah, so can people not see my screen? We don't we don't see your screen, but it might be. You don't us. see the screen. <laughs> Was there, yes. Just one more thing. Ah. Are people not seeing the no, slides? It's, it's us. It's us that we are not uh, swap video. I, All right. There you go. Okay. So now we, we have you. And let's confirm with the other. Yeah. The audience can see it. So we are fine. Okay. Welcome, Michael. Thank you for participating in our conference and workshop. And the stage is yours. Very good. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been an extremely interesting workshop, um, lots of uh, new ideas, and I look forward to sharing uh, some more information with you and some thoughts. Uh, all of the primary papers, and, uh, and if you need to get in touch with me, these two websites, you can reach me, all the papers, the data, the software, everything is, is there. What I'm going to tell you about today is a framework that I've been developing based on um, our empirical data. So probably about 15 years of, of work uh, at the intersection of uh, developmental biology and computer science that has uh, driven uh, my attempt to pull together some, some, some deep ideas for how to understand this and how to uh, move it forward. And I call this TAME, T-A-M-E. Uh, that stands for technological approach to mind everywhere. And basically it's a framework for understanding truly diverse intelligences. Um, you'll see what I mean by that based on uh, fundamentals of a kind of goal-directed behavior in unconventional agents. So the main points that I would like to transmit today are these. First, that the question of how much agency or cognition uh, is to be attributed to a particular system has to be treated as an engineering problem, not philosophical pronouncements of what various systems can and can't have, but actually um, uh, an empirical approach uh, to find the, uh, the optimum level of description to uh, enable uh, control and prediction of that system. And I'm going to talk about the fact that uh, very diverse intelligences can actually be directly compared with each other and placed in a sort of uh, the same space. If we think about the spatiotemporal scale of the goals that these systems are capable of working towards. So this gives rise to a kind of a model of what I call the cognitive light cone based on the types of goals that these systems are able to represent and pursue. And I'm gonna show you that synthetic bioengineering and some advances in, in biology provide uh, an incredibly large option space for new bodies and new minds. These new creatures don't have standard evolutionary backstories. In this, they are uh, a very important uh, set of uh, systems for impacting our understanding of evolution, uh, of what the genome actually does, and, and so on. And I'm going to show you some very specific examples uh, from developmental biology, looking at uh, morphogenesis as a kind of unconventional collective intelligence, meaning the collective intelligence of cells, solving problems in morphous space. That will be the example in which I'm gonna illustrate some of these concepts, but I think they're much, much broader than, than that. And I'm going to uh, show you some data showing that uh, developmental bioelectricity provides an interesting window on the scaling of cognition, both during development and during evolution. So, um, I started this framework uh, uh, prompted by a really interesting conference uh, at the uh, uh, Diverse Intelligence Summer Institute um, that uh, Templeton Foundation put on, where we were asked to come up with a way to compare truly diverse intelligences. And this isn't just you know, humans, apes, um, birds, and maybe octopus, things like that. But it's actually, it needs to, a, a good framework is going to enable us to uh, compare and contrast really unusual creatures, colonial organisms, swarms like ants and, and bees and so on, but also synthetic biology, so engineered novel life forms that never existed before, both unicellular and multicellular. We should be able to use the same framework with AI, so artificial intelligences, whether embodied or uh, purely software or whatever, 
and of course, exobiological agents <clears throat> that we may find um, during exploration of uh, off, off the planet if, if that ever happens. And uh, the key to this framework is that it has to move experiments forward. It cannot be pure philosophy. It has to actually uh, suggest, uh, make predictions and suggest novel capabilities. So the outline for today's talk I'm gonna, uh, is in basically in three parts. First, I'm just going to talk about uh, some examples and some uh, some 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 ways in which we we, we should broaden typical uh, cognitive science approaches. Then I will talk about this uh, this framework, uh, the philosophical principles, and then some some very specific hypotheses for how we can define selves and how cognition can scale. And then I'm going to show you the, the the vast majority of the talk is data. So I'm going to show you how we've been using these ideas to understand and control morphogenesis as a collective intelligence. And then I'm gonna show you some uh, novel uh, synthetic organisms that, uh, that have never um, be, be existed before. And these are called xenobots. So the first thing I want to think about is the fact that uh, when we usually think about intelligence and, uh, and, and cognition and agency, we think about this, the subject of all of those things, the self. So the self is this construct that is the owner of complex memories of uh, credit assignment among the individual parts uh, that that function together to pro to provide positive and negative uh, outcomes. Uh, it's the it's the owner of goals and and uh, preferences and things like that. And the interesting thing about this is that biology shows us that these these selves are extremely malleable. They change over time, not just evolutionary time, but actually during the time of the uh, the time of the organism. So, for example, here's uh, here's one example. So this is a caterpillar. And it's a creature, it's a soft bodied kind of creature that crawls and chews plants. And it needs to turn into this very different type of creature that flies and drinks nectar. And because of that, the brain um, is completely different. So the caterpillar brain is quite different from the, um, from the um, of, uh, butterfly or moth brain. And during this process of metamorphosis, that brain is largely liquefied. The cells, many of the cells die. Um, most of the synaptic connections are broken. And the, a completely new brain is rearranged. This is all during the lifetime of the agent. So if, you know, if you're philosophically minded, you can ask yourself what it's like to be an agent uh, during, during the time that your brain is completely reorganized. One of the most amazing things about this is that the memories which caterpillars have, in fact, persist through this process. So the, the butterfly remembers training that, um, that caterpillars underwent. And there's, there's been, and some nice data on this. And you can see reviews of that here. Um, but this is, this is, in fact, not just for, for unusual metamorphosing creatures. All of us made the journey of the Cartesian cut from a single cell. So we all started life as a single uh, fertilized egg. This is something that molecular biologists would look and say, this is a machine. This is, uh, this, you know, it's a molecular machine. It has lots of biochemical uh, components functioning according to rules. Um, it's a very nice, uh, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very nice piece of physics. And then at some point, this, um, this self-assembled into one of many creatures, in, uh, some of which at least, or possibly all of them, have what we consider to be cognition. I mean, let's say a human in the case of a human embryo. So all of us went from, uh, under, undertook this journey. And so, so one thing that is clear in biology is that there is no sharp line that is supportable where you can say, this was just physics and then something happened and now you have a cognitive being. So, so we have to understand how, um, how cognition scales gradually across these kind of, it scales and it modifies gradually uh, both during evolutionary time scales and uh, the animal's own development. So this is another way in which ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny because we all take this, take this journey. So in fact, uh, we like to think of ourselves as integrated uh, beings, intelli true intelligences, and then maybe uh, ants and bees have some sort of um, collective intelligence, but actually we are all collective intelligences. We are all made of parts. Uh, we are, um, in particular, we have um, collections of neurons and various other cells. And so when you look through, uh, through life forms, you see that they are made of nested subunits, not only structurally, we all know that um, we are made of organs, made of tissues, which are made of cells and, and so on, not just structurally, but actually um, functionally and uh, cognitively, because uh, there's this evolution uses this multi-scale competency architecture where every layer solves problems. So from the swarm to the individual animal, to the organs, to the uh, cells and the subcellular components, all of these systems uh, solve various kinds of problems in diverse spaces. Okay. Now, um, what evolution does is reuse some of the same problem solving tricks 
in different spaces. Now, we are all very uh, familiar with understanding intelligence when we see it as uh, operating in three-dimensional space, behavioral space. So we see these birds, they know how to pick up cigarette butts and receive a reward. And, and we say, okay, that's pretty intelligent. The bird has, has learned something. All of our sense organs point outwards. And so we are, we are very familiar. Many, many animals are very good at detecting agency in the outside world. But if we had sense organs pointing inwards, let's say a kind of uh, biofeedback where at every step of, the, of, the, of um, your life from, from childhood, you knew exactly what your liver or your pancreas was doing with respect to what are the physiological states, what are the, uh, the, the actions that it takes, we would then have no problem recognizing some of their behavior as intelligence. And what I mean by intelligence is simply problem solving to move to uh, better regions of some state space. And these spaces might be the space of all gene expression. Of course, these are all very high dimensional spaces. I, I sort of collapse everything in, into two spaces here, but the space of all possible gene expression, morphospace, which we'll spend the most of the talk about, which is the, uh, the, 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 conf the space of possible configurations of the body. So, so anatomy, anatomical space and physiological space. Okay, there, there are many, many examples. Your, your organs and your cells are solving problems in these spaces all the time. And we should, we should be humble about the fact that when we look at a system and try to understand how much and what kind of intelligence it has, we are ourselves taking an IQ test because recognizing goal-directed problem-solving behavior in a system requires us to be smart enough to notice it, to, to notice the appropriate space and to understand what is the system doing. And many times when we don't see that, we need to ask ourselves if, if, um, if we're in fact missing something important. So um, one of the things we can say about intelligence in all these spaces is basically that a kind of a generic statement is basically that it's proportional to the ability uh, to, to stay out of local, local minima, minima, to have a uh, kind of a, a wider view of what actions you should take. So that, for example, you know, this from, from here to here is the most direct path where, where this dog can get to where it wants to go. But actually, if it, if it was willing to have some patience and walk away from it for a while, it could then do much better, right? And so, so there's, this, there's this sort of local energy barrier that the, the more intelligent you are, the more you're able to overcome these kinds of things. And one of the things that we now are able to do with, uh, with, with chimeric and bioengineering technologies is take this multi-scale biological system and replace any, at, at any level, replace components of this with new uh, components that might be engineered, and they might be other cells or, or molecules of other creatures. Uh, and so we can build these composite beings that are uh, not standard issue evolved creatures. So we can replace um, we can we can replace uh, any level of organization. We can replace with components that are somewhere on this uh, on this scale, somewhere between evolved and designed. So maybe they're natural, maybe they're modified, maybe they're completely engineered, and they will have some degree of intelligence. Maybe they're just pure mechanism in the sense of um, the very passive mechanisms, or maybe they will be uh, quite uh, quite intelligent problem solving uh, problem solving components. And already we start to see this, right? So you have humans with various appliances. So so basically early stage cyborgs. Um, we have bioengineered animals. We have uh, synthetic um, uh, machines like hybrots, which are brains driving robotic bodies, and so on. And so so you can see this at at every at every uh, at every portion. We can start to replace these. These, these components, right, with whether with, with DNA or with tissues and, and so on. And all of these are going to be somewhere on this, uh, on this hierarchy. See, what's important about this is once we start changing all of these things, we can no longer use the familiar touchstones of phylogeny. We can't say, well, this kind of looks like a fish, so therefore I expect fish level um, sophistication of, of cognition, because the, the, all of these uh, synthetic, and we'll come, we'll come back to this, these synthetic um, creations are uh, not going to have uh, origins or components that make it very easy to say what's going on. So we need a kind of cybernetic understanding of, uh, of, of, of cognition that isn't based on what you're made of or how you got here, but is actually based on much more, uh, much, much, much deeper um, principles of what your cognition is like. And so that's, so, so that, that's, uh, it, it is, is the beginning of, of how we started thinking about this, uh, this, this, this approach. And, uh, uh, we, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the theory now, and then and then we'll get to the data. So the foundations, and 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 I only say this because I like to make these this explicit. You're going to see all of this in the next uh, in the next sections, but I'd like to I like to make the mm, 
philosophical um, underpinnings of all this completely explicit so we all know we all know what's going on nothing is, is hidden here the first thing is that uh, I think we need to take evolution and developmental biology very seriously and that means doing away with binary categories you know when we talk is it really cognitive is it just physics or is it does it have real memories you know there, there are no sharp categories here everything is is very gradual and we'll we'll, we'll talk about that the point here uh, is that we're not we're not trying to anthropomorphize simple systems. In fact, I, there's there's it, nowadays now that we understand evolution and, and bioengineering, I'm not sure there's any such thing as anthropomorphizing, in the sense that you know humans have some sort of magical properties that can be incorrectly attributed to other other types of beings. I don't think that exists. I think as long as you're appropriately scaling. Uh, your uh, your model to to whatever system you're working with, and it's giving you uh, empirical advantages. Um, that's that's how we have to do this uh, because there's there's no other there's no other way to do it. And so we're we, I'm I'm going to stick very closely to an engineering approach where uh, I'm not worried about uh, talking about goals uh, in the in the cybernetic sense. Um, I'm not talking about I'm not worried about trying to avoid um, you know attributing too much agency to things because attributing too much agency is just as bad as not attributing enough, right? To an engineer, these are these are identical errors. And so uh, we'll talk about the fact that agents are a patchwork of multiple unconventional intelligences at different levels. I don't believe there's any magic in the material. There's nothing really magic about synapses or protoplasm or anything else. Um, so we're gonna be uh, material independent here. And I really want to understand biology, um, which Chris Langton uh, refers to as life as it can be. Right? So not zoology, not just the types of plants and animals we have here now, but actually uh, what, what's, what's, unique, um, uh, what's, what's unique and important about all, all uh, cognitive systems. So one of the things that, uh, that this, uh, this framework does from an engineering perspective is simply uh, say that there is a, uh, there's a continuum, a smooth continuum with, with some, some, some waypoints uh, you know, so along, along uh, this, this journey, where the way that you need to understand the, the cognitive um, capacity of whatever system you're dealing with is really defined by what is the, the, the most efficient, most, most optimal way to interact with that system, the way to change the way the system functions. So if you're dealing with a certain class of uh, of, of hardware systems like, like uh, clocks, for example, your only option is modification of the hardware at the lowest level. You're not going to teach it anything. You're not going to convince it of anything. Hardware uh, modification is your, only, is your only option. Then there's a, there's a more interesting class of devices like thermostats, which, uh, which are a little further along because they have a, an encoded set point. Right, so they have they they spend uh, energy to get to, to to maintain a specific goal state, and you can interact with them in a very interesting way. You can rewrite or alter the goal state, and then the machine will now pursue pursue that goal. Let's say a different temperature range, without you having to rewire the hardware. You don't have to change the hardware of the system. In fact, you don't even have to know about the hardware. You don't have to know how it works. If as long as you know what the set point is, you can recognize uh, where it's encoded and and so on. Then uh, there's another. There's a whole other class of systems uh, like this where uh, you actually need to know even less about what's going on because you can train them. And so human beings have been training animals for thousands of years without knowing any neuroscience because they appreciated the important fact that systems like this can be uh, can be modified based on stimuli, based on rewards and punishments, and you can actually rely on the system itself to reconfigure its own internal um, mechanisms. Right, in terms of plasticity and, and various other things. And you don't need to do that. You don't need to micromanage it. You don't even need to know how it works. You just need to understand how to motivate the system, how to communicate with the system. And then we get to some very advanced creatures here where you can actually communicate not simply with rewards and punishments, but actually with, with cogent reasons for doing things. So this is, this is a very engineering approach because, because the idea is not to have philosophical um, sort of feelings about whether thermostats do or do not have real desires. The point is actually for any given system, well, in any given, let's say, novel biological or novel um, kind of engineered system, uh, this, it's, it's the, 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 the task is very simple. Which kind of model gives you the best prediction of control? So using these kind of models on these systems uh, will give you uh, no, nothing of use. But actually using these kind of models on sophisticated systems actually leaves a lot on the table as far as capabilities. And this is one of the limitations of modern molecular medicine 
is that the assumption is that everything is a, uh, a, a piece of passive hardware like this and must be dealt with at the hardware level. So genomic editing, pathway um, uh, rewiring, pathways, protein engineering, everything is focused on, on the hardware. We've actually done a lot of work showing that uh, some of these other approaches are much more powerful in, in uh, medical um, kinds of circumstances where you're trying to get the system to do something complex. So um, the, uh, the, the what, one way to uh, think about how all of these different, uh, very diverse types of systems can be related to each other is simply to try to map, and again, I've collapsed uh, space into one dimension. This is almost like a Minkowski kind of diagram where we can, we can, we can plot on a diagram of space and time what is the scale of the goals that a given system is able to pursue? Now, remember, this is not a diagram of how far a system can sense or how far away it can act, but actually the size of the goals that a system is able to pursue. So if you're a bacterium or something or a tick or something like that, you are only interested in very local concentrations of certain compounds. You may have a little bit of memory going backwards. You may have a little predictive capacity going forwards, but everything you're doing is in a very small um, a radius of, 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 of a goal directed activity. You're only interested in very local things. And in fact, you're not capable of caring about uh, things that are very far away. So, so it forms a kind of cognitive light cone of the things that you are even that, that your cognitive system is capable of doing. And so we can think about other uh, other animals that may have some pretty good memory going backwards, a little bit of predictive predictive capacity going forwards but still unable to really uh, care about things that are going to happen two months from now in the next town. It's just impossible, right, for, for some of these. But if you're a human, for example, you might have an enormous light cone. In fact, uniquely among animals, you might care about things that will for sure take longer than your lifespan. Some of your goals are actually not achievable because your lifespan is not as, 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 uh, as big as, as your goal space. And then we can imagine all sorts of other shapes for, for possible alien or, or synthetic um, kinds of creatures. And of course, all of this is nested. So we are a patchwork of uh, modules within modules, each of which is capable, whether in physiological space or anatomical space or behavioral space, contain various sizes of goals, right? Very large, very small, and so on. Now, what's, what's really interesting is that um, uh, the, the scale of these cells can change quite rapidly. So here, this is, this is one cell. This is a lacrimaria. There's no brain. There's no nervous system. This is one cell that is handling all of its anatomical, um, uh, physiological, behavioral, metabolic needs at the level of a single cell. Now, these cells, um, uh, you know, relatives of these single cells can, communi can uh, collaborate together to work on very large things. Here you see a multicellular body. This is a salamander. If you amputate the limb, uh, the cells immediately begin to grow. They will continue to grow and shape a new limb until it's complete, and then they stop. So we'll talk in a minute about what this is. This is a, a, an anatomical homeostasis where the set point is very large. All of these cells are solving a problem in anatomical space. They start out in a region of, uh, of anatomical space that's not good. They want to get to the much better region. That is their goal, and they know how to, the, the collective is able to, to get there. So that's the scaling of goals that occurs during evolution, but there's actually a reduction that takes place and we call that cancer. So what happens is when individual cells, and this is a human glioblastoma, when individual cells become disconnected, functionally disconnected, I'll show you how this works, functionally disconnected from these large scale goals, they revert back to a ancient unicellular amoeba-like lifestyle where their only goals are to reproduce, and to optimize certain metabolic functions, which means migrate wherever life is good. Okay, so the, so the boundary between self and world, in this case, these cells basically treat the rest of the body as just an external environment. They're not more selfish than any other, than, than any other um, biological construct. They're equally selfish, it's just that the self is not very small. Right? So that boundary between self and world can grow and, and shrink. And so the way, the way you can schematize it is simply this, that you have individual individual cells, and this takes place at many layers. I'm just going to I'm going to introduce this uh, with with this example of cells. So um, individual cells have some uh, degree of uh, being able to uh, compute and 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 remember and make predictions about um, states of of their local environment. But when they join into networks, these uh, these net, and in particular, I'm going to talk about electrical networks. These networks are actually have a lot have have higher IQ. They're not only measuring um, information from from wider uh, from wider spatial areas, meaning they're integrating lots of uh, lots of uh, signals spatially, but they actually have higher computational capacity, and they're able to 
uh, they're able to have larger scale goals. And so, so this is what we see. You can you can sort of track the the the, the width and space and time of the um, uh, of of what these cells are concerned with. And here's a very important um, uh, component of this, which is which is which is stress. This idea that what what stresses uh, what you know what's what stresses different kind of agents is is basically a delta between your goal states and the state you're in now right stress is what drives you to make changes whether it be through gene expression or physiology or behavior to get closer to your goal so stress is a kind of metric um, but what's very interesting about stress is stress isn't just that delta stress is uh, the ability to export that delta to your neighbors so the idea is that all of these cells are able to uh, measure something much measure states much larger than what individual cells can 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 care about, and uh, and thus and thus reduce the the delta for much more complex states. So one can say that uh, if you tell me what you're stressed about, I can make a pretty good guess about your cognitive sophistication. So if you're stressed about local, if if the most complicated thing that could possibly stress you is local uh, glucose level, then you're probably something like a bacterium. If you're stressed about uh, you know the state of uh, the economy um, on Earth, then you're probably a human level or or above. These are, you know being able to be stressed by complex large scales of events is a very a strong driver of, of sophistication. And so what you can see, this is uh, now let's, let's look at some, some, some data here. What you can do is you can uh, introduce uh, oncogenes, in particular human oncogenes, into normal cells in this frog embryo. This is a tadpole. So here's, here's the eye, here's the gut, um, the spinal cord is back here. So we can introduce these, these oncogenes. And what you can see, the first thing that happens when these oncogenes uh, are active is they cause the cells to detach electrically from their neighbors and to enter an aberrant bioelectrical state. This is a voltage map, and I'll show you in a minute, we use this a lot. We map the electrical state of these cells, and here they are, you can actually catch them uh, converting to, uh, to uh, this, this kind of ancient amoeba-like uh, state. And, uh, and, and the, the, mo the most important thing is that you can actually suppress this process, despite the fact that the oncogene is there, if you grab control of the bioelectric state of the cell by co-injecting uh, an ion channel that's going to, uh, even though the oncogene is very strongly expressed, there there may be no tumor because you're managing the uh, the goals that these states are going that these cells are going to follow. They are now connected to their neighbors, and they're all working towards making a nice uh, you know nice uh, skin, muscle, and and everything else. One of the most important uh, things that evolution discovered to to do that uh, is this thing called a gap junction. So gap junction is this. Uh, it's a it's a primitive synapse. It's an electrical uh, it's an electrical synapse uh, used throughout the body that enables cells to directly communicate with each other through their um, to, to, to connect to directly connect their intercellular milieus. And what that means is that uh, traditional signaling like this, you have one cell and it produces some kind of uh, signaling factor, and uh, it it you know it diffuses and this cell can feel it. This th it's very easy for these cells to remain to um, remain separate and keep their identity because once you receive a signal like this, you know it came from the outside, and so you can ignore it. You can you can you can remember it or you can uh, not remember it. it, it you, you have th this cell has its uh, set of memories and this cell has its set of memories about past events that have happened, and, and it's very easy for them to be separate. But once cells become coupled by these gap junctions, something very interesting happens. The information that comes across does not have any metadata about the owner. Okay, so anything that happens to this cell that triggers some kind of a, a second messenger response that serves as a as a memory engram of that experience, once that propagates into this cell, this cell now has no way to tell whether that information originated within with, with was uh, related to this cell or in fact it came from this cell. So all of the experiences and um, and prior history of this cell are now shared by them both. They cannot separate uh, who's who. It's a kind of a mind meld, so to speak, because their, um, their uh, internal milieus are linked in an important way. And so now a lot of their individuality is, is really stripped, right? You, get, you now get this one uh, system with a larger, uh, larger networks, larger IQ, lots of memory of, of, of what happened to both cells, but it's no longer possible to keep that very strict um, separation. And this is how goals scale. So what you can do, and 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 we're making um, some very um, uh, some very rigorous models of this, is you can start with very simple homeostatic loops, single cells. All they do, let's say pH, right? All they do is they sort of they they measure the pH, they compare to set point, and then they either um, load uh, acid load or efflux. That's it. And so so these very small, very humble goals. Once you start connecting these cells by gap junctions, 
you have a bioelectrical medium, you have this excitable medium that's able to uh, store and process very large states as goals. And this is something that's, that's been worked a lot in hot field networks and other kinds of um, systems. So we are, we are making those kind of models to understand large scale memories, uh, in particular pattern memories, as a scaling of simple homeostatic units in electrical networks, right? It's a kind of a connectionist approach. So let's so let's look at let's look at some um, some real data and let's see what what you can do with all this. And so we'll do two things. We'll talk about uh, morphogenesis as a collective intelligence, and then uh, we'll look at this uh, this novel protoorganism. Okay, and we're going to try to understand uh, how these goal memories are actually stored and processed. So the mechanisms by which collective intelligences of cells store um, set point information. So the first thing. Um, I just want to mention is that uh, there are uh, there, there's huge plasticity in living things, which has really important implications for evolution. This is a this is a tadpole that uh, we've made. Um, there are no eyes in the primary where they're supposed to go. So these are nostrils. Here's the brain. Here's the gut. So what we've done is we suppress the primary eyes, but we we induced an eye on the tail. And we can have a separate discussion about how we do that. We do that through the uh, techniques that uh, I'm talking about today. We induce the eye on the tail. And we have this machine that tests these animals for visual learning. It basically trains them for certain behaviors and visual, um, visual cues. We find out that these animals can see perfectly well. Um, this, this eye uh, synapses onto the spinal cord, not the brain. And their behavior is quite normal. They can, they can learn. They can see. Uh, they have very nice, very nice uh, visual behaviors. And so what this means is that uh, the, uh, the ability of, of, uh, of evolution to explore the, um, the, the, the various configurations is greatly potentiated by the fact that if things happen, let's say there's a mutation that moves the eye, uh, no problem, your, your behavioral repertoire doesn't automatically fall apart such that uh, now your fitness is very low. In fact, the animal can, uh, the animal can still, uh, still function and then you can explore other um, other consequences of uh, of that mutation. So, so this is so this is really important. And this ability, this 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 plasticity, and this ability to handle novel circumstances, right? That's the key here is the novelty. This animal evolved for millions of years to process visual input from the eye fields, but one changed, and 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 it can it can handle this. This is another example of uh, problem solving in physiological space. So here's here's a flatworm. These are planaria. I'm going to show you much more uh, much more of this. These uh, flatworms have this amazing property of regeneration. So if, uh, if you cut off their heads, for example, they will regrow a new head. In fact, they regrow everything. So what we found is that if you take one of these planarians and you um, expose them to barium chloride. So barium is a nonspecific potassium channel blocker. It's a really a bad problem because now these cells can't uh, pass potassium. So the heads of, of uh, the heads of these planaria literally explode um, overnight. It's just, um, it's called head deprogression. They literally explode. But what's incredible is that over the next couple of weeks, if you leave the animal in the barium, they will regrow brand new heads that are completely normal, that are barium adapted. They have no problem uh, with barium whatsoever. So what we did was we, we did some uh, transcriptomic analysis to simply ask the question, what, what new genes are expressed in these animals that are not expressed in these animals? W you know, how is it that they're barium adapted? What happened? And it turns out it's actually a very small number of genes that was changed in order to, uh, to do this. So now think about the, uh, the critical part here is, is two things. One is that barium is not anything that planaria find in nature. So there's never been evolutionary selection to, uh, to uh, put up with, with barium. It's completely novel. And the other thing is that cells in the system don't reproduce quickly the way bacteria do. So you can't uh, use some sort of a selectionist explanation that basically everybody tries random uh, sets of gene expression and whoever survives repopulates the head. There's no time for that. These cells don't turn over that fast. So it's almost the problem here. Think about this problem. You have tens of thousands of different genes that you can turn on and off. It's sort of, I visualize this as a, a nuclear reactor control room, right? Your, your, your cells are poisoned. You have this physiological stressor. The cells are poisoned. Thing, you know, everything's melting down you have to find a very small number of genes that you're going to up and down regulate to solve this problem. You've never seen this problem before. How do you know which things you are going, which genes you're going to turn on and off? And so part of that might be some sort of generalization from other problems you've had that may have been similar. For example, um, excitotoxicity, epilepsy, things like that may be similar to this, but it requires an incredible amount of uh, a problem solving uh, ability to navigate that transcriptional space, that space of all gene expression to find exactly what you're looking for. So 
Uh, so that's so that's an example in physiology. Now let's look at, at examples in anatomy. So this this here is uh, a cross section through uh, the kidney um, tubule of a newt of a salamander. And if you look, the normal uh, tubule has uh, you know eight to ten cells or so that is um, that that work together to build a lumen of a particular size. Right? These tubules have a particular diameter. What you can do is you can make uh, you can make these newts with uh, progressively larger cells, and you do that by um, inducing extra copy numbers of their chromosomes. Amazingly, the cells put up with it and they just simply get bigger. The cells, the cells get bigger. As the cells get bigger, what you will see, and this isn't our work, this is this this goes back to the um, to the 40s. What you will what you will see is that uh, fewer and fewer cells are now working together to make basically the same size lumen. So they're adjusting the number of cells based on this really novel and unexpected outcome of, uh, of having to build a salamander with much larger bricks. Okay. So this is, you know, if we had, we had a robotics building something, you could give it a completely different size of brick and it would make adjustments and, and, and things would still work. We don't have anything like that. The most amazing part of this is that if you make cells that are truly enormous, what will happen is just one cell will bend around itself okay, uh, and achieve the same outcome. So completely different molecular mechanisms, not cell to cell communication, but now cytoskeletal bending that gets you to the same place using a different uh, set of molecular uh, components um, in service of a large scale anatomical feature. So this is very much looks like um, a kind of top down control where the goal of making a tubule can uh, be uh, can be implemented with with diverse you know it's it's got that degeneracy it can be implemented with diverse molecular mechanisms and you call it, it this, the system executes uh, whatever it needs at the lower levels to to to, to maintain um, the correct region of uh, anatomical space at the higher levels we we don't understand how this works but it fits nicely William James's definition of intelligence which is uh, same goal through different means, right? The ability to reach your goal when things are changing, including in this case, not just changes of internal, ec external environment, but changes of your, of your own components. Your cells are now way bigger than evolution prepared you for, and you can still do what you need to do. Here's another example. This is a, this is a frog. Frogs, unlike salamanders, normally do not regenerate their legs. And so um, what we've done is we've, uh, in, in some of our work uh, that uh, aims towards regenerative medicine, we've, we've, we've figured out how to make them regenerate their legs. When you do that, something very interesting happens. This is an early leg. These early, here's, here's a toenail, here's some toes. These early legs don't look anything like uh, the way that legs normally develop. Eventually, they get to the same place and they make a very nice uh, frog leg at the end. But the intermediate paths are not uh, like developmental uh, strategies at all. In fact, they look kind of like a plant, really. Um, it's, a, it's just a different way to navigate morphospace to get to the same outcome. So what you see here is that biology has this incredible plasticity of behavior, of physiology, and of anatomical construction to get to the same goals via very different paths. And... Um, and as I'm going to show you in a minute, also from diverse starting positions. So, so that plasticity, that intelligence of, of these systems is, is really important to understand. And as we think about shape, we, we have a very basic question. Where is anatomy specified in the first place? I mean, so you start life as a collection of blastomeres, right? You're a bunch of cells descended from, from um, the egg. And uh, this is a cross-section of a human torso. This is amazing. Look at this uh, incredible invariant order. All of the the cells, the organs, everything is in the right position, the right orientation, um, uh, the right uh, uh, the right location uh, relative uh, relative to each other. And so, uh, how does it know where it actually uh, where, where, where these things should actually go? Now, people naturally say the genome, but of course, uh, the the we we know how to read genomes now. And what's in the genome is the specification of the micro level hardware. DNA specifies the proteins. There's nothing in the genome that directly talks about anatomical size, shape, symmetry type. Um, it, you know, it's all about the micro level hardware. So, so we need to understand how does this order arise? We need to understand if part of it is missing, how do we, um, uh, how do we repair or, or, or edit this? So, you know, how, do we, how do we get the cells to rebuild? And then as engineers, we want to go one step further and ask, well, what else could these cells build? And how could we convince them to build something completely different than their default outcome? And so um, I've already shown you this, that these, these individual cells are very really competent on their individual cell uh, scale, but it gets, it gets much more interesting in examples like this. 
Uh, this here, what you're seeing here is uh, this is a normal tadpole. So here are the eyes, here's the brain, here's the gut. And these tadpoles need to become a frog. In order for a tadpole to become a frog, they have to rearrange their face. So this means that uh, they have to move, their jaws have to move forward, their eyes have to move inward, um, every, everything has to move. And it was thought previously that somehow the genetics basically tells each organ the direction and the, um, and the amount to move because then you can always go from a standard tadpole to a standard frog. So what we did was we made these, we call them Picasso frogs. They are uh, completely mi mixed up. Everything is in the wrong place. The jaws are off to the side. The, um, uh, you know, the eyes are on the back of the head. Every, everything, is, everything is moved around. And when you do this, what you find out is that they still make uh, largely quite normal frogs because all of these organs will move around in unnatural paths. In fact, sometimes they go too far and they actually have to, have to come back. They will keep moving until a correct frog face is built. So what the system actually does is uh, the genetics doesn't specify the, move, the movements. The genetics specifies the, 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 uh, the seed that constructs a machine that minimizes error. It's able to, uh, from, from novel starting configurations, it's progressively able to minimize the delta between where we are now and what the correct face is, which obviously raises some important questions. How does it know what the correct frog face looks like? So, um, so, so in my group, what we've been doing is this, this is kind of the standard um, model of, uh, of, of uh, developmental biology, where you have gene regulatory networks that, uh, that turn each other on and off. Some of these genes make proteins that are sticky or they diffuse or they're doing various things. So then there's this parallel physics that goes on. And then there's this uh, process of emergence where if lots of individual pieces do the, the execute these, these local rules, then eventually something very complex happens like this nice um, salamander. So, so this is all true. This is all happens. Of course, of course, uh, there is a feed forward a emergent a component to this, but there's actually also a very uh, important uh, set of feedbacks that occur both at the level of physics and genetics. And we're going to talk about um, the, the, the physical one here today that basically executes a, uh, a, a loop of anatomical homeostasis when the system is perturbed from its normal target morphology. And this might be with injury, with, uh, with, with precancerous um, uh, conversions, with uh, teratogens, um, mutation, anything that takes the system away from its correct uh, shape kickstarts uh, cascades that will try to get back to the correct uh, location in, um, in morphous space. So what we needed to know was, can we find the, um, the storage mechanism for this set point, right? Every, every homeostatic process has a set point. And so what you want to do is you want to find uh, the storage mechanism of the set point and you want to know how to change it. Can we learn to read and write these set points? And this is very important for um, the kind of biomedical approaches that, uh, that we're really um, focused on in my group, because uh, making changes here, which is what all of molecular medicine tries to do, is to make changes somewhere somewhere down here, is incredibly uh, difficult as a means of changing what we really care about, which is anatomy, right? Which is solving birth defects and and traumatic injury and aging and things like this. Because reversing this to be able to to decide what changes do you need to make is incredibly hard. This is an inverse problem that's probably unsolvable. To try to in in general to 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 try to reverse this uh, highly nonlinear, highly recursive process to say, what do I need to do at the micro level to get me to a desired uh, system level state? And so what we would like to do is we'd like to change the set point, leave all of this intact. The cells are very good at implementing different set points. We just like to change the set points. So where is it encoded? So we took our inspiration from the brain. Um, we know how this works uh, in, in brain. Brains are, are an excellent system for maintaining uh, behavioral set points and uh, uh, being intelligent about getting to those set points. So we said, how does this work in the brain? Well, in the brain, You've got some you've got some uh, some cellular hardware that basically uh, is a set of electrical networks that uh, is the home of the um, interesting uh, electrical dynamics, which you might call the software because it's able to be changed by experience and so on. And what people in neuroscience are doing is uh, this project called neural decoding. So so the idea the commitment is that if you were to uh, read and be able to decode all of the electrical activity in the brain, you could infer the, um, the, the memories, the preferences, the goal states, you know, that's where it's all encoded. It's all encoded in the electrochemical dynamics of, of what this hardware is doing. And what the nervous system is using all this for is to coordinate muscles in three-dimensional space so that you can move around and do various things. What did evolution, where did this come from? You know, in evolution, this is, uh, brains didn't just appear out of nowhere. These electrical systems are actually ancient. Even bacterial biofilms have all of this stuff. So what did this look like before we had brains, before we had muscles for large-scale behavior? Well, uh, it looked um, actually surprisingly 
sim similar. It, uh, we have the exact same scheme. So you have all cells in the body are actually producing these, uh, these electrical uh, dynamics through the network. And uh, what you can do, and this is a video um, of a uh, early frog embryo, we're tracking the voltage. This is not a model or a simulation, this is real data. You're looking at all the um, electrical dynamics as you might when you look at a brain that we could try to read and we could uh, test the hypothesis that these electrical dynamics are the medium in which the collective intelligence of these cells is making decisions. Who's going to be anterior, posterior, left, right? How many heads do we have? And things like that. So it's a very parallel project to what neuroscience is doing, but taken away from, uh, sort of generalized away from neurons and, and, um, and asked about all cells. So uh, just again, to nail this down, all cell, this is developmental bioelectricity. All cells have ion channels, all cells set electrical um, resting potentials. They communicate those through gap junctions, which we met a few slides ago, uh, that can communicate them through um, uh, to, their, to their neighbors using the exact same uh, mechanisms. Uh, and, um, and, and here you can, you can read about um, how, how we think that, uh, that, that uh, coordinating uh, problems in morphous space was the basis of uh, intelligence in behavior when evolution pivoted from uh, just coordinating the body shape to actually um, running around in three-dimensional space by using muscles and, and, uh, and, and sense organs and things like that. So um, uh, let's, let's think about uh, how then, if I'm, I'm making the claim that, that these uh, bioelectrical uh, patterns are a kind of cognitive, uh, protocognitive medium for making decisions in anatomical space. And I'm just gonna show you one, uh, some examples of that. So here's our planarian. Here's the flatworm, here are the eyes, the head, here's the tail. Uh, what we can do is we can first ask, uh, let's look at gene expression. Which of these cells think they're part of the head? Well, it's this one, these blue cells here, right? So there's anterior gene expression in the head. There's none in the tail, that's very good. That's how it's supposed to be. When you cut uh, off the head and the tail, this middle fragment remembers exactly what goes at each end. And pretty soon you have a new uh, planarian, one head, one tail, fine. Now here's another planarian, again, one head, one tail. Again, anterior gene expression in the, um, in the head, that's fine. When you cut this guy, you get something amazing, which is a two-headed form. Now this is not Photoshop, these are, um, these are real animals. Now, why would this animal with normal gene expression and normal anatomy, why would this animal suddenly, by the way, this process is, is 100% uh, of fidelity, you know, it's, habit. It's, it's, it's very hard to make them make a mistake. They always basically do this correctly. Why would they suddenly make a two-headed animal? Because in the meantime, what we did was we looked at uh, a bioelectrical circuit that, um, oops, uh, that we looked at this, this bioelectrical circuit and we realized that there might be uh, some, uh, there might be a gradient, some electrical communication that allows these, these cells to, to remember how many uh, heads they're supposed to have and where the heads go. And so what we did was we learned to, uh, to, to suppress this. And this is not with applied electric fields or magnets or anything like that. This is by using um, uh, RNA interference and specific drugs to uh, target ion channels, target the native machinery by which these cells uh, produce the voltage gradients. And what we found is that um, these animals actually make uh, two-headed, uh, two, the, these, these, once, once uh, the, elect the bioelectric circuit is perturbed in a very specific way, they actually make two-headed animals. And one of the most amazing aspects of these, uh, these two-headed animals is that, and I kept calling this a memory, here's why, if you were to recut this animal again in plain water, no more manipulations of any kind. So you, you chop off the primary head, you get rid of this uh, ectopic uh, secondary head. If you thought some of these cells were you know, epigenetically reprogrammed to be a head, fine, they, they, we throw them away. All we leave is this nice normal gut fragment. There's, no, there's nothing weird about that, about the, this gut fragment, the, the, the genetics are, are unchanged. And so you might think that it should just regenerate a normal planarian, but that's not what happens. They regenerate these two-headed forms. And if you cut those, they still regenerate as two-headed forms. And this is basically permanent. And we now know how to change that circuit back with, a, with another brief um, bioelectrical uh, uh, drug uh, um, uh, stimulation, change it back to being one-headed. So the question of how many heads a planarian has or is supposed to have is quite interesting. The default that, uh, that the hardware uh, specified by the genome will make is one, but that's not really uh, where the information is stored. The information is stored, as I'll show you momentarily, in the real-time electrical state of a circuit that tells these cells what the target morphology of a correct planarian is. It is the set point. And that set point is not genetic. The genetics here are untouched. We didn't edit the genome or anything like that. We, uh, we uh, change the encoding of what the correct state 
is uh, um, considered by these cells when they are injured. And so this meets all the properties of memory. It's long-term stable, it's rewritable, it has conditional recall, which looks like this. So the reason that, uh, that this guy made a two-headed animal is that we looked at the bioelectrical circuit. Here's what a normal one a state looks like. The voltage here just tells you one head. And what we did was we altered it, and it's a little messy, the technology is still being worked out. But basically what we did was we induced uh, a different pattern memory in the exact same kind of body. So this says, when you are injured, you will build to the target morphology, and this is what the correct planarian target morphology looks like, make two heads, and that's what it does. So to be uh, super clear, this electrical map is not the memory of this existing animal. This is a memory of this one-headed animal. So a one-headed body, a normal, a normal body can store at least one of two different representations of what a correct planarian should look like. So this is what I mean when I say the bioelectrical state is the mm, protocognitive medium of this collective intelligence. The cells are literally keeping a representation, a, a visible, I mean, we can read this now and we can rewrite it, a visible bioelectric representation of what they should do if they get injured. Until they get injured, this pattern is ignored. It's a latent memory. It doesn't do anything. Once it gets injured, then you see what it is because it guides them to make this, this uh, two-headed worm. Now, this kind of approach can make uh, ectopic heads of the same species, and that's, uh, that's kind of uh, uh, sufficiently surprising, but it, we can go further than this. And it turns out that what you can also do is push the tissue to recall memories that belong to different species. So here is one planarian species that has a triangular head. You chop off the head, you perturb the electrical network in a particular way where you basically prevent the cells from communicating with each other very well for 48 hours. During that time, um, everything gets uh, kind of confused. You withdraw the drug, the network settles back down to a stable attractor. When it does, that attractor sometimes is the correct one. So sometimes you get a nice triangular head. Other times it lands in the wrong uh, attractor that actually belongs to other species of worms. So you can get round heads like this uh, S. mediterranea, you can get flatheads like this uh, P. felina, okay? Um, and it's not just the shape of the head, but actually uh, the, uh, the shape of the brain is changed to be just like these other species or the, and the distribution of the stem cells is changed. And again, no genetic change here. We didn't do anything uh, to, to alter the hardware. We altered the ability of this electrical network to remember what the correct pattern is during regeneration, okay? And this is, uh, you know, the, the idea here is not just to, um, to, to, to make weird looking uh, worms, you know, worms and frogs. There's a lot of uh, biomedical uh, implications to all of this where we're looking for um, optimal control of these kind of outcomes in a way that doesn't require us to try to micromanage gene expression and so on, which I don't, I don't think um, will be doable in our lifetime. So, um, you know, there, there's applications here for cancer, obviously, both diagnostics and for normalization strategies. So not chemotherapy, but normalization. And of course, for um, regeneration, you know, using triggers to regenerate, um, regenerate complex organs such as limbs. And so in the last few minutes, I just want to show you a um, uh, step, step away from uh, kind of natural, natural bodies to show you the, the, re, the, real, um, the real plasticity of, of, of cells and, and how, how remarkable this is. So... Uh, Evolution provides standard animals with a set of uh, instincts that operate in anatomical morphous space. These are default outcomes. This is why uh, acorns make oak trees and zebrafish eggs make zebrafish, right? There's a default outcome. But uh, much like in the nervous system, there is a lot of reprogrammability here. And so we um, wanted to um, understand how much plasticity there is. And so uh, we wanted these, these new pattern memories, we wanted to see if they could form uh, very rapidly and we wanna understand where they come from. So, so this, is, this is the work of uh, staff scientists in, in my group, uh, Doug Blackiston. Um, we have a collaboration through this new institute with uh, Josh Bongard's lab at the University of Vermont and, um, and his uh, student, uh, Sam Kriegman, now a postdoc in my group. And what they, uh, what, what they were doing is computational analysis of the following situation. If you take cells and you liberate them from their normal environment, Right from the normal uh, set of instructive interactions that the cells are uh, that the other cells are telling them to do, you know, this larger network that has these bigger goals, would they reboot their multicellularity? What would they do? Okay, well, if would they cooperate? And if so, what it, what what is it that they would build? So we did this simple experiment. 
Here's a frog embryo. We take some, some skin cells off of, the, uh, off of the top of this early embryo. So these are, these are ectodermal cells. Uh, we dissociate them and then we put them in a little, um, in a little depression. You can, you can see that here. So basically we just dissociate them and then we just pipette them down into this little hole. And so over the next, uh, over the next 24 hours, they will simply compact like this. Okay, you can see them, they compact together. Right? And then um, here, this is actually the flashing you see is actually calcium signaling. It's um, some very interesting signaling dynamics, but they make this, this, this round sort of thing. Now, they could have made lots of, they could have done lots of different things. They could have crawled away from each other. They could have died. They could have formed a monolayer like you see in cell culture, could have done lots of things. Instead, what they do is they form something we call a xenobot. Xenobot for Xenopus lavis, that's the name of the frog, and uh, it's a biobot platform. So first of all, what you see here is that they are self-motile. So here it is swimming along. They have cilia. The way the reason they move is they have little um little hairs known as uh, known as cilia that uh, that they use to uh, to 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 row against uh, against the medium, and um uh, and so and so they 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 swim along. These cilia are normally used on the skin to uh, um, uh, to move pathogens and, and mucus um, off of the uh, off of the surface of the of the frog. And you can see here that uh, that they have all kinds of behaviors. This one goes in a circle. This one sort of patrols back and forth. Right uh, here is some tracking data on a group of them. This one's going on kind of a longer journey. This one is going in circles. These two are interacting with each other. These skin cells normally are restricted to a very boring two dimensional life, sitting on the outside of a tackle by the rest of, by the instructive um, signals from the rest of the animal when liberated from this they it turns out they have a completely different capacity to cooperate and make a new uh, sort of little proto animal um we didn't add anything we didn't edit the genome this is uh, we didn't induce it we didn't put any um any uh, trans genes there are no um, nanomaterials all we did was take something away we took away the restrictive in, in uh, instructive signals that the rest of the cells impose. And we ask these cells, what do they want to do? So now you're starting to see this, this, this multi-scale um, multi competency architecture where the plasticities that, that I've been showing you about uh, being able to correct for all sorts of defects and so on is because all of the components have their own agendas which can be modified by the larger scale network that they're a part of. But you can start to see this when, the, when some of those are lifted. Now. Uh, here is uh, here it is in a maze. This is filled with still water, so there's no water flow. It's completely closed, so you can see it. It it takes the corner without bumping into the edge. Um, it then decides to turn around and come back where it came from. Okay, so some sort of internal uh, dynamic. So here it is um, swimming along. It can uh, it can take this corner without having to bump into the opposite edge, so it somehow knows that there's a possibility to take a corner here. And then, uh, and then it turns around. We don't know why it turns around. They have all sorts of spontaneous um, behaviors, right, in this system. They have the interesting capacity to regenerate themselves. So if you uh, cut them in half, this one was basically like pinched in half. You can see here over this 180 degree uh, that hinge right there, right over that 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 180 degree. Um, the forces the forces must be must be really strong. But what it was able to do is able to try and fold itself back up into its new shape, into its new xenobot shape. And if you actually pay attention to the calcium dynamics, you can see it's very brain-like. They have, uh, this is, you know, this is basically what, what calcium uh, looks like um, in, uh, in, in brains when you image living, living animals. There are no neurons here. This is just skin. Everything that you've seen was just skin cells cooperating towards a new kind of morphology, right? They have another very interesting behavior that we first saw that's a kind of herding behavior where they operate in groups like this and they, 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 they do these kind of circular um, these kind of circular behaviors to make little piles. And, and why do they make little piles? Well, the most amazing thing is that um, these little piles, if these little piles are themselves skin cells, then what they will do is they will push them together into these little piles. Guess what the little piles become? The little piles become uh, the next generation of xenobots. So there's, there's a couple of interesting things going on here. First of all, uh, this is a kind of replication. It's not a real lineage. They don't have strong heredity yet, but it's a kind of uh, 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 replication because given components in the environment, they will uh, make copies of themselves. This is much closer to um, von Neumann's idea of reproducing machines than to the way that any other organism reproduces, right? So they will, they will go around, they will make uh, you know, multiple generations of these little balls and the little balls become xenobots and continue the cycle and keep doing it again and again. One interesting thing is that um, what's happened here is that when we made it impossible for these cells to uh, reproduce in their normal fashion, 
within 48 hours, they have found a new way to pretty much do the same thing that has never existed, as to our knowledge, never existed in evolution. No, no, other, no other animal does this. And so uh, this is an amazing example, I, I think, an amazing example of, of problem solving and plasticity. When you can't do things the original way, you can repurpose your existing hardware to swim around, to, uh, and, and then to undergo behaviors that will actually uh, do, do things that you can't do the normal way. That, that, that's the first thing. The second thing to note here is that when we made these xenobots, we, it, it was very much a collaboration between us and the cells themselves. We don't know how to tell cells to assume a particular shape yet. All we were able to do was to uh, remove some, some constraints and put them in the new environment. The cells did all the rest after that, all the heavy lifting. and we, and. Uh, this is this is very important because it's a new kind of um, robotics and engineering where your material is not passive, it is not active. It's more than that. It's an agential material, right? The new, um, I think, the future of bioengineering is you know, of engineering in general is working with parts that are themselves um, some sort of simple uh, or maybe not so simple homeostatic agent. So that what you're doing is you're not engineering the way we normally engineer. You micromanage every part. You have to know how to do everything. You are actually uh, um, um, signaling to with, with you know you're, you're trying to shift the way that, uh, that 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 your parts are going to behave because they have their own behavior and evolution does exactly that when these when these bots make the next generation of bots this only works because the material they are working with the cells that they are working with is itself an agential material and is going to do the same things on its own that's the only reason this works and that's and and the same is true of evolution when you when you try to change an organism you have to motivate and uh, and and uh, uh, affect its guided self assembly. The cells that you're working with, they have their own um, they have their own agendas. And so, what when you see these xenobots, they have a normal frog genome, and and these xenobots don't have a straightforward evolutionary backstory. If you ask why do xenobots have a particular uh, behavior and structure, the answer is not because for millions of years they were selected to be good xenobots. There's never been any xenobots. So um, the cells themselves were part of the evolutionary stream on Earth, but they were selected for a completely different set of um, functions. So we really need to understand how it is that evolution uh, doesn't make it doesn't find solutions to specific problems. It finds machines that solve problems in novel ways, right? So here's the here's the unique developmental sequence of a xenobot. This is what normal frogs do. They are they look like this, then they look like that, then they run around like this. This is what xenobots do. They make a they make a body like this. Eventually, they will transition. In you know, two months later, they transition into something that looks like that. Where does that come from? That's never existed before um, during evolution. So um, just to close up. Um, Here's here's the, uh, the, the, the the summary of what I tried to, to say is that uh, there is a framework which is really focused on a continuum of agency, not binary categories. It's very um, engineering uh, focused in terms of finding the best, uh, most appropriate um, uh, models for to explain uh, the scaling of, of cognition. Uh, the materials uh, don't matter. There is no privileged um, substrate. One useful way to think about systems is as the scale of goals that they are capable of, uh, of, of pursuing. We can think of intelligence as problem solving in abstract spaces. And developmental bioelectricity is a great way to start to look at how competent individuals can scale their goals. And I think that's exactly what, um, what evolution did. And we can certainly do that. Evolution is hugely uh, potentiated, sped up by this kind of multi-scale competency architecture. And the biggest, uh, to me, one of the biggest questions going forward is where do these goals come from? It's not going to be selection. Where else um, can they come from? And I just want to uh, uh, remind people that now with the new technologies, everything that every, every um, organism you've ever heard of, right? Everything that Darwin meant when he said endless forms, most beautiful, all of that is a tiny little corner of this incredibly large state space of, of cyborgs and hybrids and, and chimeras and um, all, all possible combinations of evolved material, uh, engineered material, and um, artificial intelligence. And we're going to have to be able to uh, relate in some way to these things when we're not able to say uh, what it is and what it's capable of based on what it looks like and where it came from. So um, lots, of, lots of papers on all these things. I'm happy to um, send, send things out. Um, these are the... Um, the people that uh, did all of the uh, the hard work of the things that I showed you today. So I thank them. I thank our collaborators, um, our funders, of course, um, and and the model systems, which which always do the heavy lifting. And I will uh, stop here and thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah.
Uh, can you hear us, Michael? Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah. Well, amazing talk. What can I Thank say? You. I'm I'm really really impressed. I knew some of your research personally, but now that I see more, I want to know more. Very very nice uh, attractor of topics. Um, well, you. we start with the question round. Anybody has questions, comments? Yeah, Francis. Well, I think what this illustrates is that agency is something uh, very primitive in life, and that agency is not just adaptation, as you say, to very specific selective pressures, but it's adaptation to a wide range <coughs> of things. So it's the, the plasticity, it's the flexibility, it's the adaptivity that has been selected probably. So I assume that these cells have some general agential behaviors which adapt to the circumstances and when the circumstances are very different, like in the case of these xenobots, I assume there is still enough agency left that they can do things that look kind of intelligent, even though they are completely different from what they normally do. So yep. uh, I, it, 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 it reinforces a little bit my uh, proposal in my talk but I said that the first step is after self-maintenance, it's resilience, where resilience means expanding your basin of attraction. That means expanding the space in which you can solve problems. So what these things probably have learned a very long time ago before they were folks is to expand this space of problems they could solve. So that now if you take them out of their normal space where they are in the frog's body, they can still do things in this completely different space because they have not lost this kind of generic agency you might call it. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's that's right. That's absolutely correct. Uh, we, of course, one of the big mysteries that we now have to uh, address, and we are we're doing this in, in computational models and and, uh, and and at the bench, is to really uh, understand how evolution is able to produce this because the standard, you know, sort of the standard story is that evolution is supposed to always pick the immediate um, you know, sort of short-term benefit, right? And uh, how it is that that it maximizes this incredible uh, ability to problem solve instead of uh, a very hardwired. And, and certainly, there are animals that act hardwired in various ways. You know, sea elegans and things like that. But 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 lar but but the majority are exactly as you just said. And so, how that arises from from evolutionary dynamics that are that you know we're always told are very um, kind of um, short sighted and and you know always taking the immediate benefit. It's it's not clear, and that that represents a, a huge area for for research. Uh, well, my hypothesis is that when we think about evolution, we're thinking about organisms that are already very highly specialized, and then they are already so well optimized for certain things that they can't afford to take risks to make too many changes. But if you think about the origin of life, and you think about autocatalytic systems, where there are all kinds of molecules coming and going, and, and temperatures changing, and, and, and water entering and drying out, these very first cells, they had to be extremely non-specialized, they had to be extremely mm -hmm. resilient, they had to be extremely adaptive. And probably these properties are just properties that define life to have, to get to the first uh, living cells, you had to have this extreme adaptivity. And then when, once you had this more specialized organism, you didn't need all these functions anymore, but they are still there because they're probably the essence of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. More comments, questions? No? Well, um, I have a, li a little question here. This hand has a little question. Uh, ah, it's frozen. <laughs> Even better. Yeah. Um, um, so, I, as I understand, you you are using the 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 electrical field on the cell or the how what what electrical what is the volt you measure the voltages but what what would be like the the real uh, object that is uh, being uh, measured there 
Yeah, what, what we're measuring is uh, the, the voltage difference between the inside and the outside of the cell. So every cell has a membrane and there's an electrical potential between zero and let's say 80 millivolts that's uh, between the inside and the outside. So what we're looking at is if you think, think, about, um, think about a neural network or an artificial neural network where every node has an activation level, right? And so what we're looking at is the, uh, the electrical state of every individual cell, but that's not actually where, you know, that's not actually the, the, where the information is. The information is in the flow of electrical computations through the whole network. So what we're measuring is, 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 the, is the spatial uh, pattern. And then over time, we, we take videos uh, of each individual activation weight. It's exactly like, um, it's exactly like neuroscience, except that the time is, is greatly scale, uh, slowed down. So all of the, you know, you can take almost any neuroscience paper and just do a find replace in Microsoft Word, replace the word neuron with the word cell, replace millisecond with hour, and everything else basically works. It's, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. So, so these uh, patterns are across uh, multiple cells then. It's not the... the oh, yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's critical. That's critical. It, it's, it's not individual cells. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So I, uh, cells, yeah. Okay. And then, I have. Uh, yeah. so, sorry, if did it. When the last, yeah, yeah, the last but continue because, first. It's it's the it's the it's where I'm getting to the question. So ah, yeah, okay. Um, so you are using now. We, we, there is this uh, uh, genetic information that is kind of like the hardware you were mentioning. Then you have the electrical field, which is the, the electrical component, which encodes an extra mechanism, which has been kind of like overlooked by by evolutionary morphogenesis or like by the field you were mentioning. And then I wonder, um, like this is the, the, my wonder is like, might there all be other forces at play? Um, have, you, have, have you studied or measured or why will it have to be only electrical? Uh, yeah. So, so that, that's the, since there are many other physical quantities that sure. might have similar sure. dynamics, dynamics and play sure. a role of mini transmission and so on. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. There, 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 have, there are many others and many people study them. There's biomechanical forces. There is ultra weak photon emission. Uh, there are of course chemical gradients that everybody studies. All of these exist. Uh, my claim is not that they're not important or that bioelectricity does everything, no. But, but bioelectricity is where the only data that I know of has been um, obtained where those bioelectrical dynamics are actually the memory medium of this collective intelligence. It's possible that uh, you know, 10 years from now, somebody will find out that the biomechanical stress patterns are also storing the same thing. Entirely possible, but it hasn't been done. The only, you know, these other, these other forces have been treated as, as pieces of physics at the lowest level that need to be tracked to, um, to understand the system. And their bioelectricity is exactly like all these others. But what we have shown, I think, is that bioelectricity has a really important role as the, uh, as the, as the actual uh, medium of the computation. So it's like, you know, you can look at a computer and, okay, yep, there are stress forces, there are vibrations, there are, um, you know, uh, heat uh, gradients, there's all kinds of th things going on. But if you want to uh, really understand what computations are doing, the bioelectric, the, the, you know, the electric patterns through the circuits have a privileged um, status. And maybe these other modalities will have the same thing. Uh, it's entirely possible. Maybe evolution uses them all, but it's but it's not known. It's only known at this point for the bioelectrics. Yeah, yeah, that was my my question. Please, Dietrich. Yeah, uh, very amazing talk. First of all, and I knew your work already. Yeah, so, but okay, it was nice to see all these little details explained carefully. No, I, I I'm a quantum physicist. Huh? So electricity is, is photons, huh? so in a certain way, I wonder actually, certainly because you have this memory effect, huh? so there is something new being revealed here, I think, that has not been really identified and that is difficult to, to explain out of Darwinian evolution, even in, in, in an easy way at least. Huh? in a straightforward way. Well, that's also the message which was a little bit in your talk, I think. Yeah? Uh, so I wonder whether, because 
it would be too long to, to, to tell you the details now, but I could send you some, some, some material there. But right. let's say we are working on, on an interpretation of quantum physics where this would fit in in some way, you see, that there would be things happening on the quantum level in, 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 in photon clouds, which, which, which were not, which not have been revealed uh, yet, yet clearly that have to do with, with meaning, meaning that would be stored in, 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 in light in some way. And uh, so, so it's amazing, it's amazing these experiments. Thank you. I knew them already, so it was not the first time that I saw them, but let's say that, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd be very happy to, yeah, please send you, me, uh, yeah, uh, send me, uh, send me what you have, yeah. I will send you on an email because this would take too long right. to, yeah, yeah. to make it's, my own uh, explanation. Exactly the, the kind of things that we want to, want to happen, that we connect with each other and also the, the online audience can also bring, bring connections and why not keep, keep discussing. I'm, I'm totally interested in this and I know some people who will be interested too, so. I'm kind of new to the topic, but it's extremely, extremely interesting as for me as well. Please, Francis. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, another thing that I find very interesting in your work, I have heard about it is before this idea of the cognitive boundary, where you use the metaphor of the light cone, but I'm not sure that's a very good metaphor because the light cone kind of extends in this way while yours comes together. So maybe more something like a cognitive horizon, I would say. The horizon is as far as you can see. And I personally have been using the, the concept already for, for years of prospect. The prospect is what you can see ahead of you and what you can imagine to be good or bad. So prospect is both an anticipation and a notion of good or bad or value. The prospect is the things you see potentially that you may go to or that you may want to avoid. And I think your notion of cognitive bond is very similar to my notion of prospect. And indeed, the trend in evolution, you might say, is to extend the prospect because the larger the prospect, the easier it becomes to find something valuable to go towards, a goal that is worthwhile, and the easier it also becomes to see the potential dangers and to avoid them. So um, I, I just heard the commentary about uh, Teilhard de Chardin, where Teilhard de Chardin, who had a kind of a mystical philosophy, but he had very good intuitions. He had this role of complexity consciousness, where he says during evolution, complexity and consciousness increase at the same time. And this notion of consciousness was a little bit like this notion of the cognitive boundary. As evolution progresses, the systems can see farther, can see wider around them. And that comes to his idea of the noosphere by the internet. Now we can all, in a sense, see what's happening all around the world. So it's this extension of the of the cognitive boundary, I think, or what I call prospect. I think that's a very important uh, idea. Mm -hmm. Yep, I agree. Can I say something? Can you hear me? I can hear. Yeah. You. Yeah. yeah. Ah, great, yeah. Michael. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, for this for this um, amazing talk. I just want to uh, make a make a make a notion uh, in terms of um, interdisciplinarity. Um, um, because what you said, uh, I find super interesting and super amazing. Where, where is um, the shape defined or located in the first place? This is the one uh, question uh, you, you put. And the, the other one was, how does it, the system knows when it is right, the, the, the forming of the shape? And these two questions are exactly the crucial, crucial questions in, in design. In the in the artistic process, so this did really strike me when you um, were saying this. So where are these, and is it possible to find these set points? Uh, and so I think this 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 um, this happens on 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 many different levels. These I think these are two very very deep and important questions. Um, this is just what I want to 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 say. Yeah. Um, so really, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I took a bunch of notes uh, during your talk, so I will be uh, I will be emailing you afterwards. I, I completely agree. There are some nice nice similarities here. Yeah. Mm, great. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. Okay, amazing. Then um, we will take a little break um, to have some coffee on this side of the of the universe, and then uh, we'll see you back for our last talk where Massimiliano Sanin will tell us about transport networks and why they 
modeling is the wrong way. Um, so I will stop the recording now and then stop the call so the videos can be generated. So see you in nearly 15 minutes. Okay, thank you guys. Until soon. Thanks, Michael.